Yeah, getting ready for the interview. Feeling the pressure, everyone's watching. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ik wil een cap. Kan die ook dicht blijven, deze? Ja, we doen die When people think of fast-paced motorsports that have money thrown at them, people naturally think of Formula One, uh, MotoGP, but actually nestled in that same category, and maybe the most intense of them all, is MXGP. It's undoubtedly the most physically demanding sport in the world, and also these are riders that are racing on back-to-back -back weekends in different countries and different continents. MXGP is one of the most exciting series in the world currently for motorsport. Anything can happen, any time of day. These guys are putting in the work. Uh, it's a full-time job. If you haven't done the work, if you haven't done the preparation, if you haven't sacrificed everything else to be ready for that war on Sunday afternoon, it will show up and you will regret it. MXGP is a global encapsulation of motocross, really. Um, a frankly ridiculous sport that blends extremes of skill, uh, bravery, fitness, judgment, and let's be honest, wanton delusion. I'm Jeremy Siever, I'm from Switzerland and I ride for Monster Energy Yamaha Factory MSGP. Now he's a guy, especially in the last two to three years, that's really, really doubled down on getting the job done and being dedicated and focused to battling the most competitive athletes in the class. And finally, Jeremy Siwa runs out the final turn. He wins for the first time in MXGP. Yeah, I'm on the podium and I'm quite frustrated, but I have to be happy. I won my first race, uh, made a good gap, and I'm on a good position right now. Jeremy is a rider who has obviously never missed a Grand Prix in his professional career. That total sits at 128 and into 2021. But also when he started that career, uh, way back in 2014, he was attending school on a full-time basis at the time. You know, I had no idea where does my career bring me because I was still, you know, the little guy coming from Switzerland, not much motorsport around. Uh, I was doing good, not super well, but I was good, you know, so I, I never knew do I manage, manage it complete to the top or not. So it was always important for me to, to do school. Star Energy Suzuki Europe, Jeremy Seward will take his first race win of the year could make many passes in the first two, three laps and then, uh, yeah, I won the race and I'm so happy about that. Not only was he trying to break into the scene and prove himself to these team owners, he was also trying to achieve grades and deliver on that front as well. Yeah, it was one of the toughest times of my life because I had uh, two times 100% and, yeah, I was ill a lot and these kind of things because my body was just empty, you know, most of the times. But afterwards, I think I'm glad I did it and yeah, it worked out in both ways actually in the end, so that's perfect. The fact that he started every Grand Prix of his career and hasn't missed a round to date uh, is, is a phenomenal commodity. I think it's a, something worthwhile that manufacturers maybe don't rate as much as the, the, the potency to win events or that kind of outright speed that we see in, in Jeremy Sewer's rivals, but his championship finishes you know, bear testament to his consistency. His effort level is really what seems to make the difference for me. I don't believe that there's anyone in this class that is trying harder to go faster than Jeremy Sewer. And you can see the mistakes being made. You can see many times that he's riding over his head a bit. He's a little bit out of control. 
but I think he's come to the conclusion that if that's what it takes to ride with the likes of Geiser and Hurlings and Cairoli, then he's willing to do it. And I believe if he can stay healthy, if he can continue to improve and find this pace becoming more comfortable, that's going to be a very dangerous situation for the rest of the field. We can, we can see, we can feel that he is uh, growing, he is stronger himself, he is stronger uh, mentally. Every year he is more uh, confident and, and uh, also believe that he can uh, be in the front, he can also win uh, GPs and uh, uh, sure everything will help him for uh, this year and uh, maybe year after to, to be world champion. I can't get it turned on time. That's cool. Got the gun with me, you know, just in case of emergency. I mean, yeah, it's not loaded, so don't worry. I'll leave it, I'll leave it. Yeah, super cool. I got to show you the horn, actually. This is the cool thing. So just on the way to Lommel, uh, gonna go do some riding and uh, yeah, gonna go in air first. Gonna turn traction off. Pressure is always on yourself. You you know what you need to do, and if you want to continue on this path and you know have the the support that you have now, yeah, you, you always have to give everything. And it doesn't matter if you're if you're on a private team or if you're on the, the best factory team in the paddock. You have to give everything and do what you can. Otherwise, yeah, it's it's going to be the last year. I think for the Yamaha team, if they truly want to be competitive and have a chance to win this MXGP crown, they have to take it seriously. We saw how potent Jeremy Sewer was last year in the steps forward he's taken. But if you look at the return of Jeffrey Hurlings, you look at the, the competitiveness of Roman Fevre, and Antonio Cairoli surely wants to get that 10th crown. You have the returning champion of Tim Geiser. There are so many riders that are in their way it's still going to be a challenge. Red Bull KTM are the dominant force in MXGP. That's fact. HRC have now risen to that level following the multiple titles that Tim Geiser has acquired. And it would seem that Yamaha are the next in line to do that, thanks to a team owner who simply won't stop. It really seems as though Louis Vosters won't let anything get in the way of him achieving his dream. Whether the team needs more manpower, more resources, or even just money thrown at the operation. It just seems as though nothing's going to stop him or stand in the way of his dream. Yeah, sure. With, without Louis, I will be not here. And uh, yeah, Louis uh, give everything uh, for, for, the, for the rider, for the team, for me. The fact that he decided to create his own team uh, was a very powerful and forceful movement. And the resources and the quality and everything he's put into the setup is something I think that's made the Monster Energy Yamaha MHGP team one of the most envious in the paddock. I'm Louis Vosters from the Netherlands, uh, Bergijk. I'm team owner from Yamaha Monster Energy factory MHGP team. One of the things that I think sets him apart from everybody else is the fact that he is now focused 100% on that motocross team and becoming a world champion. To literally give up or, or walk away from the company that he founded to just solely focus on winning a world championship, I think you have to, 
take this guy serious. 2019, I, I, I stopped uh, being uh, CEO at Wilvo. So now I full focus on, on, on motocross, on my team. Whether it be in his personal life or his business, he has always reached the goal that he set for himself and it seems as though motocross will be no different. He certainly won't stop until he does reach that pinnacle. To have a team around you, you fully trust, you, you, you can rely on. Uh, it's not only a mechanic who has to do his job, it's like a full on, it's kind of a family which has to work, you know. Uh. She make this only for you. If you want, you can share with everybody. But... Oh, okay. No, at the moment, uh, I keep for me. Yeah, it's better. <laughs> Factory teams and satellite teams, it's usually a matter of resources, equipment, attitude, and staff as well. We can walk around the paddock and be impressed by hospitality units, awnings and trucks. Uh, and there's still quite a diverse you know, collection of, of those kind of rigs in MXGP in 2021, even though the level of the sport is arguably higher in terms of that technical support system back in the paddock. Calvin Vlandering was one of those MX2 riders who achieved great things. He won GPs, he was on the podium many times. So he entered MXGP with aspirations of doing the same. Obviously he wanted to be at the front, that's what he was used to. But when it came time to move on to the 450, a lot of doors were shut. There were no options for factory rides and truthfully, there were no options for any rides. The Gebben Van Venroy deal came through last minute and had it not been for that, we might not be talking about Calvin Vlaanderen as a MXGP rider anymore. My name is Calvin Flandren. I'm uh, from South Africa, but I race for the Netherlands and um, I race for Gavin van Benroy Yamaha. Um, I think he proved that he can be one of the leading riders in MXGP. Uh, I mean, he took his MX2, first MX2 victories in quite impressive fashion in Indonesia. And here he is, Calvin Vlaanderen, Team HRC, takes the win and the overall victory here at the MXGP of Indonesia. It's unbelievable, I mean, oh, there's no words for it, I'm just speechless. Those last two laps are so long, the team was encouraging me, I just pushed, 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 but it's, it's incredible. I just want to say thanks to my whole team, my family, my girlfriend, and lucky that she's not here, but just everyone, thanks so much. One thing that's been holding Calvin back has just been the attrition that's eaten away at his results in terms of putting together a consistent campaign. Injury is probably one of the biggest or the biggest rival any rider will face uh, when it comes to motocross and Grand Prix racing. And at the moment, Calvin is still trying to get the better of that foe. Yeah, we're here um, in Eindhoven today for some uh, physio, some rehab for the knee. It's not really rehab anymore. I'm uh, pretty much past that phase, but it's just building the muscles up and um, getting it strong to be back on the bike. That's pretty much that's necessary at the moment. So coming back from an injury is incredibly difficult because not only are you chasing riders that have been training and testing during your downtime, you're also trying to just get your body back to full strength on the level that it was pre-injury. So the two most important aspects of returning from injury are managing expectations so you don't get disappointed if there are struggles and then setting attainable goals so you can continue to improve throughout the season. And by hopefully by the end of the season, you're right back where you were, but it has to be a process. Riders who come from good backgrounds have the opportunity to pay for rides, pay for deals and accelerate their career a little bit. Obviously not everyone can do that. And in Calvin's situation, he's come across from South Africa with nothing, no family. He's really building himself as a person from zero. My dad got a call from a German, uh, a German team, Bodo Schmidt, um, say, oh, we want Colvin to race the full season. We want him to stay here in Europe. And I was like, uh, I was like, yeah, damn, I, I want to race for sure. I want to stay here. So I had the, the bag for three weeks. I lived off that for the whole year. And uh, just looking back, like where I lived, I lived like in a small passageway uh, to the bathrooms of this, of this uh, workshop. But at that age, you, you don't know any better. You just, you know, you have one goal and that's to race here and, and you want to make it as an as a MXGP world, as a world championship racer. The fact that Mitch Evans was bumped into HRC meant that the bosses, the likes of Marcus De Freitas, Roger Harvey, and the rest of the crew, you know, in red, saw something in the Australian which he had proven in fleeting outings in MX2. 
you could argue and say that his his rate of injury and accidents was on a similar level to Calvin, so who deserved the ride more? But there is something to be said for the way a rider moves in a team, the way a rider builds a team, the way a rider works with a motorcycle, develops it, and creates a bit of a team ethos, and maybe HRC thought that Mitch was a better fit or a brighter prospect in terms of what he could offer in future years. Having said that, I think Calvin is an extremely capable rider. If he can stay healthy, avoid the mishaps and misfortune and keep his confidence up, then I think he's going to be proving a lot of people wrong. It frustrated me a lot when it happened. When I, when I heard that, that Mitch got signed instead of me, I was like, you know, why, why him? Why not me? I was like, I, on paper, I can show the team that I'm the better rider. But anyway, at the time, I was really angry, and I, um, I've, you know, I've put that in the, in the past, and I've moved on. And uh, I'm still good friends with everyone in Honda. Um, they treated me really well, um, but you know, I won't forget what they, how they, how they finished with me. In the same thing, like that. I believe the story for Calvin Blandern is he just needs to show patience. This MXGP field is incredibly deep, and there's talent everywhere you look. So I think if you're Calvin, you continue to improve, you continue to work on your skill set, and each and every time you get the opportunity, you have to make the most of it, you have to show promise. So when it does come time for a contract, you're right at the top of the list for potential riders. I definitely believe that if I feel comfortable on the bike and I'm in a, in a good space, I can definitely be fighting for podium, 100%. I don't, don't have one single doubt in my mind, and that's gonna lead me to get a factory team, 100%. This knee is also stiff, and I, I ran because I was I was not in a good mood, and I ran to to sh shut him up, and I put it like a stopper behind the door, you yeah, know, so the door yeah. doesn't slam. Yeah. And I forgot about that, so I ran to the door, and the door just stopped as soon as I went out, and it hit my face and hit my knee like on the corner. You know, I, I, that's I went, cold. I went lying on the floor because of pain, <laughs> and then like two seconds later, I just started laughing because I was that was so stupid. You know how that's cold. It what is it called? Karma. For what? Yeah, you said you were annoyed. Yeah. <laughs> and then after that, I was even more mad at the dog. <laughs> Yeah, Yamaha took the decision uh, for Ben to, to put the mirror in our team. It was quite late in the season, but, but at the end of the season actually. But I think it's really good to have one, one young rider, one t talented young guy with th those uh, uh, top riders. I think this will work. Motocross was something I just did for, for fun and, you know, it was becoming more serious, you know, through the years. And, yeah, to be here now is, uh, when you look back, it's been an incredible journey. Uh, ben Watson is now Great Britain's hope, essentially. He's on a factory team. He's exited the MX2 class with two overall wins and multiple podiums. The end of 2020, he was undoubtedly one of the leading riders, not only in the MX2 class, but in, in, in Grand Prix overall, in terms of his form and his, in his confidence. Ben Watson, third on Sunday, second on Wednesday, your overall winner here today for the first time in his career. Obviously the ultimate goal is to become a world champion and um, that is you know, my next step, what I have and what I you know, really want to achieve before I stop racing the bike. And uh, he really fits uh, on the 450. So what we see now, his riding and the riding style and uh, it's uh, he looking really good on the 450. Sure, uh, we need he need be still more faster, but uh, I hope it's I, I know it's will coming. Oh, okay, come on, push, push, push. Okay, thanks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Uh, yes, Herlings is fast, Prado is fast, uh, Cairoli is fast, Geyser is fast. Uh, it's our really top guys, but, but here for our riders, uh, everything is here in place, so 
I think we can go for it. And uh, everything I did in my life, I tried to do for 100%. So also, uh, yeah, this chapter in my life, I, I, I want to win and, and to win a title. Like you say, yeah, I can, I can beat anybody now. Uh, it's just a matter of consistency and bring it through 20 GPs. BMX GP class in 2021 is so stacked with many potential winners. Louis Vosters is obviously hoping to get to the front of the pack with his free riders. He's got the returning Jeremy Sewer, young promising rookie Ben Watson, and then new signing, five-time GP winner Glenn Koldenoff. Koldenoff has really put himself on the map in recent years with many GP wins, many podiums, Motocross of Nations success. He's really established himself as a potential title winner in the future. He just needed that extra little edge. And that's why he's joined forces with Monster Energy, Yamaha Factory, MXGP and Louis Vosters. My name is Glenn Koldenhoff. I'm riding for Monster Energy, Yamaha Factory, MEGP. Je m'appelle Kader, je suis artiste peintre, je vis à Mazamé dans le Tarn. J'ai fait les Jeux Olympiques en 92 et mon record 8 mètres 30. Alors moi j'ai pratiqué le sport et la peinture en même temps. En fait comme deux moyens d'expression, j'avais vraiment besoin de, de, de ces deux moyens d'expression pour vraiment m'exprimer. Donc je suis fasciné vraiment lorsque je vois des, des sportifs qui maîtrisent la glisse, qui maîtrisent cet équilibre, ce genre de choses que je n'ai pas. Et donc ça, je trouve que c'est très, très inspirant. J'ai voulu euh, les mettre en mouvement, en fait, pour symboliser la fête olympique, la flamme, le feu, et puis quelque chose de pétillant. J'essaie de mettre donc, à la place du, du, du personnage que je vais traiter. Donc j'essaie de vivre le moment de ce qu'il ce qu vit vraiment. Et euh, comme ma peinture est à la limite entre l'abstrait et le figuratif, c'est-à-dire que je n'ai pas besoin de faire les doigts, ni, les nez, ni le nez, ni les yeux, ni quoi que ce soit, donc lorsque euh, le bras, par exemple, il est dans un virage, eh bien, je vais accentuer le trait. Et donc ça va donner cet effet de, de, de mouvement, de vitesse. Alors je pense que la, la compétition, elle amène justement à ce, à ce dépassement de soi. Donc c'est quand même important, ça aide. Mais je pense que philosophiquement, j'ai toujours j'ai toujours voulu en fait donner le meilleur de moi-même. Plutôt que de, de chercher la victoire sur les autres, c'est surtout sur moi-même que j'ai cherché la victoire. Et en peinture, effectivement, lorsqu'on se euh, on, on, on peint ou on crée, on essaie toujours de, de donner le meilleur de soi.
When I first met the family, I was just driving through. Then I came across this painted house. I went in and our relationship started. I really feel good about the fact that people under all odds have decided to remain who they are. It is important that uh, you keep your traditions because your children must know where they're coming from. And that has made me have more respect for the people in the rural areas than the people in the city. They have enriched me. It is a privilege to have known the Demanda family, for I would not have had the insight that I have today. October 18th, 1931. Mary had a little lamb, it squeaked with white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Inventor Thomas Edison dies in West Orange, New Jersey at age 84. Among his many inventions, the electric light bulb, the phonograph, and the motion picture camera. 1962. Three scientists are named winners of the Nobel Prize for Medicine for their work in determining the double helix structure of DNA. Dr. James Watson of the United States and Drs. Francis Crick and Maurice Wilkins of Britain share the Nobel honor. 2001. CBS News announces an employee in anchor Dan Rather's office in New York has tested positive for anthrax. It's part of the anthrax scare that kills five other people and shakes Americans following the September 11th attacks. Also in New York that same year, four disciples of al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden are sentenced to life without parole for their roles in the deadly 1998 bombings of two U.S. embassies in East Africa. 1968, two American athletes are suspended for a high-profile protest at the Mexico City Olympics. Sprinters Tommy Smith and John Carlos give black power salutes during a medal ceremony. The athletes are later banned from all Olympic competition for life. And 1926, rock and roll performer Chuck Berry is born in St. Louis, Missouri. Today in history, October 18th, Tim McGuire, the Associated Press. Welcome back in our studio and in today's news, 